So first, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for sticking with us this morning. Um, my role here is actually to draw your attention to a broad copyright reform that is occurring nowadays in the U.S. and how that actually can impact international negotiations. Uh, my name is Carolina Rosini, and I'm the Vice President for International Policy and Public Knowledge. Um, and I would be happy to also, if you are interested, to put you in contact with our colleagues that actually are experts uh, testimony in a lot of the hearings in U.S. copyright reform right now. So I have two core messages here. I think one, uh, Jeremy did address really well, that's the issue of transparency, but I want to bring another element to that discussion. U.S., I don't know if you guys follow that area, I also do open data and government transparency. Uh, with the Open Knowledge Foundation in UK and Latin America. So the US is one of the founders of a, a, of a effort that's called Open Government Partnership. And the USTR, is, which is the leading negotiator for all these trade agreements, is actually, uh, uh, is actually part of that uh, initiative and has set a series of commitments of transparency within their activities. So we did some survey, uh, some research recently, and actually U.S. Chart put both TPP and TTIP has uh, flagships of their transparency <laughs> efforts within uh, the Open Government Partnership. So that really called my attention in terms of if they are putting that has commitment, what Open Government really means. <coughs> Okay, so I was in MIT uh, on Monday and I was speaking on transparency in Brazil, I'm originally in Brazil, uh, on a series of transparency offers to do crowdsourcing legislation. And everybody else there was actually praising the transparency efforts and apps and services and millions of dollars going both from the public, uh, uh, um, uh, from uh, taxpayer money, but also from philanthropy here in the US on apps, so for example, Susan Crawford, she's a very renowned scholar here in the US, she's coming up with a new book called The Responsive, Responsive Cities. And it's an incredible book where she maps a lot of efforts in cities in the US to provide uh, access to the citizens, both to what's going on in the city, like raw data, but also to participate in decision making uh, within that city. And she's really praising, and there are incredible initiatives going on in Chicago, in Massachusetts, in Maine, in California, and so on, right? So you have this, uh, what one of the participants call our Nito Hinko policy, is, is that correct in English? So our Nito Rico policy, where in, in one side, you do have extreme efforts and money going in transparency, and in another side, a completely lack of accountability, even if there is a commitment with transparency by US chart within the OGP partnership. So that really calls my attention, and I think we as public interest organizations on both sides of the Atlantic, we should look a little bit further to ensure that the commitments made in OGP and on data actually happen on our day by day regarding transparency. And I think a lot of the recommendations that Jeremy made are would be really appropriate if you see what's going on in some OGP, in some of the other OGP uh, 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 initiatives. So that, I think, is the first uh, 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 message there. So let's deal with this ornitor wrinkle here in our backyard, you know, this thing that has <laughs> different heads and different tails that <coughs> don't make much sense together. Um, so this is my first message. My second message is regarding content, right? So my first point is that the US copyright law, but I would argue the whole system is actually under a multi-year review right now, and that started uh, after the TPP started. So we can even argue that the experts at USTR, uh, uh, I don't know how much they are actually following that and bringing that debate to the international trade negotiation. So I think we have to give a step back and really look at this uh, negotiations and this debate that's going on in our backyard. I heard one of the USTR officials saying a very dynamic uh, argument uh, and, and negotiation should really let that mature. We are not in a point that we have resolved in our backyard here in the US what we want in a lot of issues in copyright that we are now pushing in, uh, in, in the trade agreement. Plus we need to foster a positive agenda. US has commitments internationally in WIPO and other organizations to really foster a positive agenda for many years. We see that in WIPO uh, negotiations such as the Treaty for the Blind which US signed on, 
the exceptions and limitations for librarians under discussions that may uh, as well include museums at some point and exceptions and limitations for education. We are in a moment that we recognize that uh, population <laughs> is coming up to the internet. We have a huge uh, a huge new generation coming up to the internet and they need good resources to uh, be educated and to innovate and to really participate in this new century trade which is all in internet through services and access to content. Uh, and we also need agenda that's adequate for local needs of users, consumers and innovators. We need to recognize the differences, the historical differences among Europe and US and maybe really be very flexible here on what we are moving forward to ensure that those local needs and culture are respected. Uh, and I think the three-step test is one of the things that I'm going to talk a little bit later uh, uh, that deals with that really well. So, big review. So what's going on? Uh, uh, folks from US may be following, but I'm just going to go through it anyway. So you have three main four discussing US copyright uh, uh, review right now. The copyright Opsi, uh, which begins, for example, a study on music license, which, for uh, which many of you know, is one of the reasons that a lot of countries end up in the special 301 in terms of piracy of digital content. Right. So they are actually reviewing how you deal with license, how you distribute music, how you deal with music licensing over the internet and over uh, 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 other business models. Uh, they are evaluating the effectiveness existing of methods of license of music and any any and, and in very in a variety of environments. And they are seeking public engagement in this. It's really interesting to see that I call it it's the copyright review roadshow. So if you sign on to the to the copyright office, to the SGR and other uh, US governments, they are going to Nashville, they are going to Massachusetts, they are going to California. So it's really interesting that they actually are trying to engage uh, uh, people and organizations locally. In the House Representative, we also have a, a review going on. It's a very broad review. We are in the second year of a series of hearings. We have hearings almost like every 15 days currently. Uh, and the US PTO also is another track of review. They issue a green paper uh, called the Copyright Policy, Creativity and Innovation in the Digital Economy. So we have three very dynamic for a discussing copyright review. And I think that discussion is not mature yet for us to pass the rule uh, in a very restricted form in trade agreements. And I would call attention even to the American negotiators and the American organizations that we may not be there yet. We still need to solve how these things make sense for us and for our economy. Uh, so some of the lists of the issue are actually the same as Jerry pointed out in trade agreements. Are they more dynamic issues here? Clarifying the scope of exclusive rights, enforcing for sale in digital environment, uh, revising exceptions and limitations for librarians and archives, exempting incidental and temporary copies in appropriate instances, providing guidance on statutory damages, reviewing the efficacy of the DMCA Act. So this is huge when we talk about ISP liability, which is appearing in every commerce chapter of these trade agreements. And I think that's the clear link that Jeremy was doing on the internet governance debate encourage new license regimes, addressing orphan works, accommodating persons who have print disabilities, and providing guidance for educational institutions. Right, We are in a huge battle right now, as you know, with the Google Book uh, DOS settlement that just got resolved uh, recently uh, in pro the public interest in that case. Um, so I'm just going to move forward. I'm happy to uh, share this with folks later. Um, so for instance, regarding for sale, right? That's one of the dear uh, topics for public knowledge. The Copyright Act does not specify, uh, specifically account for the way consumers may distribute, share, or buy copies or download the digital works without breaking the law. There is no accounting for that. It's important to update the copyright law to meet the needs and concerns of consumers in the digital space to eliminate, eliminate this gray area which is becoming increasingly difficult to legally navigate. So we are talking about software, we are talking about digital books and so on. And if we think that free flow is one of the core objectives of many of these trade agreements, uh, for sale and related consumer rights will be a core issue that needs to be addressed in our backyard and then uh, transplanted to the international negotiation. Point two, uh, 
as I mentioned, we need a positive agenda. The position of public knowledge on international agreements is that we, any trade agreement must contain clear exceptions and limitations uh, for any exclusive rights. They must be a feature not only of domestic copyright law, but also interna international copyright agreements. And they should leave to the countries decide on some uh, models that work more appropriately for them and I think Jeremy brought some really good language examples that would address that need. Um, point three, this agenda nationally and internationally needs to be adequated for local needs and users and consumers and innovators. So for example, if we think about the three-step test here, right, has a way to deal with these local needs. Why this three-step test has been portrayed has the most preeminent provision relating to limitations and exceptions. In many agreements, the test is not a codification of any particular limitation and exception. This is really tricky, guys. Rather, it is a mechanism to measure whether limitations and exceptions of countries comply with a particular agreement. So many scholars, including many actually folks in this room, uh, have pointed out that interpretations of the test have focused on preserving rights holders and we need to see this test in the opposite way. If they are bringing the right to access, if they are dealing with uh, the issues of access, uh, limitations and exceptions, we need to interpret the test from a public interest view. And that needs to be extremely clear when we negotiate agreements. Uh, both working uh, with Jeremy and some uh, other organizations in the room doing the TPP rounds, we did a series of statements and uh, letters and explaining how the three-step test should be interpreted from a public interest point of view. And the Max Planck Institute has a, a very uh, el elucidative uh, declaration on that. And I would really recommend all of us to check that to understand uh, uh, how we should move forward on the exceptions and limitations that, and, and devise a language that's broad enough for these local needs uh, for innovation and access to knowledge. So I think that's my main message right now. And um, to really wrap up, I just would recommend that we let the discussion mature here in our backyard, mature in Europe. They are also going through copyright review right now. And then in a couple of years from now, when that's more clear what is important for our society locally, we can move forward uh, internationally. So as we as we move into 